Welcome to Open Studio on Brattleboro Community Television. My name is Chris Lenoir, and today I'm joined by Rebecca Gagnon of The Current, an organization in the process of revamping its roots here in Brattleboro, and they're holding some public hearings coming up to solicit some input about that. Good to see you, Rebecca. Thank you. Thank you for having me. So uh, the first public hearing we want to let people know about is, is a couple weeks away from when we're taping this, uh, Thursday, August the 24th, mm -hmm. two public hearings, one at 1.30, one at 5.30 in the select board meeting room. And let's just talk a little about uh, some of the types of input you're looking for from some of the people in attendance. So we just want to get a feel from the general public, the riders, employers, um, town representatives, anyone that wants to show up about what they really want to see in their bus system. Uh, it's a blank slate. Uh, we would love to hear from people that want to maybe um, go to different locations, want uh, an easier schedule to read, um, you know, maybe want to uh, have later service, earlier service, different days. So all-encompassing remarks are, are what we're, we're really looking for. Yeah, could be anything then, anything related uh, to public transportation that The Current provides here in the area. The timing of this, I mean, why now? Why are you going through this process at this point in time? Uh, we, we uh, as an organization, merged with um, the, the current uh, in 2013. And we knew at that point that the roots had not had a serious go through. Um, the roots have been the same for 10 or 11 years uh, in Brattleboro. They did have a revision back in 2011, um, and we felt that it was just time to take another look at that fresh look. A year ago, we started revamping the northern routes, um, Bellows Falls, Springfield, the routes that go to Ludlow, and um, some of the routes that go up into the Dartmouth area. So uh, this is probably one of the best times since we're changing the northern routes to take a look at what's going on in Brattleboro and make some revisions. Yeah. Do you expect to give a formal presentation? Uh, or it sounds as kind of just like sort of free for all. How do you anticipate the 130 and the 530 presentations going? The, the initial public hearing is definitely a free for all. Okay. You know, come, right. bring, bring your hopes, ideas, your visions for public transportation. Uh, in Brattleboro, but then we will have a, another public hearing that will probably be a little uh, more, more tight with what a potential route could look like, and we'll take input. Uh, there will be plenty of options for uh, public input even after we do the ser survey review and the general input on the 24th. Uh, we're hoping to come back to the, the, the town folk and um, the representatives on the select board around the second week of October for a, hey, this is what, you know, we, we devised from the surveys and this is our, our first draft of what the new routes could look like. Right. And the exact date for that, I know, is uh, to be determined at this yes. point, uh, but it'll probably be posted on your website, which is a CR Transit. Dot org. Yes. That's also where the surveys are. And I found it interesting, you have two different surveys there, one for riders and one for non-riders. Mm -hmm. uh, how different are those surveys in terms of their questions? Um, in terms of a rider will understand probably the service a lot better. Um, you know, the, the, the cleanliness of the bus, where the bus goes, when the, when the bus operates, uh, right down to uh, the, the drivers on the bus. You know, there's, there's a lot of valued input there. We're also looking for people that don't have an idea or concept about their public transportation. And what are they looking for in a public transit service? Um, so it is, it's very varied, and uh, we're looking for non-riders right now. Why aren't you riding? W what's your perception of the bus? Uh, do you know anything about the bus? So those are the, the two different aspects, two total different uh, opposite ends of the spectrum. Uh, we're trying to bring those together and, and, and create something that we can find more riders, choice riders, and keep existing riders and, and make a more seamless system for them. It struck me too that the survey option was something that would enable you to get input more from outside of Brattleboro. I mean, obviously you have a pretty big geographic area you're covering as indicated on this map mm -hmm. <laughs> behind us right now. So are you thinking more along the lines of that survey being some of these uh, outlying areas? Or? Uh, actually, the one of the routes that connect into um, Brattleboro is the 53 that comes from Bells Falls. 
Um, but we're actually honing in on the, the, the public of Brattleboro. Uh, employers, we met with the town, we've, we've hit some anchor, anchor employers uh, so far for surveys, uh, and, and, and really the people that commute into, into town, work in town, live in town, and the existing ridership. So we've not branched out to uh, Bells Falls for their input or Springfield, mm. people that really are impacted by the transportation locally is right. who we're reaching out, who we're looking for. Are you getting good response to the surveys thus far? Uh, it's yeah, been we're, for a while, right? we're, we're doing a lot of advertising, a lot of surveys on the buses. We've probably, um, within the week and a half, have about 75 surveys. Yeah. Uh, general public, uh, we have some surveys at um, the co-op, the library, uh, the Chamber of Commerce and at the Transit Center. Those are trickling in r real slow. Right. Um, but, you know, a big, a, a, a great opportunity is for people to show up at the public hearing that we'll have on the 24th. The survey is simple. It's a one page, four or five questions online. It's done. It's not a lengthy 25 question type survey. Yeah. And I'll it's very say simple. once again, crtransit.org if yeah. people want to go and take the survey there. Uh, and, and I was wondering, just when you talk about awareness about your service, and especially I know right before we went on the air, we were talking a little bit about some of the different transportation companies. Uh, there was the mover, we were talking about the B line, and there's been a lot of change and evolution in transportation here. And even when I called it the current, that's kind of not fully an accurate name for what you're doing right now, is it? Right. Um, <laughs> Let's go has, back a little morphed. in history here. A little, little bit yeah. of history. I, you know, I think people will remember the B-Line. Uh, the B-Line um, was a service that the town ran. Uh, I helped the, the town run the service. I started with them in 2003 and left in 2009. And then after I left, they contracted one more year and then they decided to put it out to bid. So the B line service, a lot of people love their town bus service with the Bs. Um, v Trans and the town decided to put it out to bid to two of the larger organization, one being um, Connecticut River Transit and one being Deerfield Valley Transit, the mover. Um, Connecticut River Transit won that bid and they took over the service sometime in 2011. Okay. And at that point in time, it was a two bus system um, they opted to reach out to a consultant and change the, the service. Um, they also had the option of going into Hinsdale at that time as well. So when the Connecticut River Transit took it over, they consulted with someone um, and then they created the white line. So they went from two routes to three, went to Guilford, went to town, down, downtown Hinsdale, um, kept the hub at the transportation center, and it's been operating that way since uh, 2011, 2012. Okay. And you had mentioned also the mover, which some people know around here, is also sort of part and parcel of this umbrella of services now. Sure. And the mover's been coming in um, since probably 2005 from Wilmington. It's a free bus service that goes from Wilmington to, to Brattleboro uh, every day. Uh, a couple times in the morning to a couple times in the afternoon. So they've been they've been a service that's been recognized and known. It's cow spotted. Um, and in 2013, uh, the current um, Connecticut River Transit and Deerfield Valley Transit decided to uh, work together. Uh, Deerfield Tr Valley Transit became a, a managing company of the current after they lost their executive director. That's when I came on board. And then uh, in 2015, we merged both companies right. and became Southeast Vermont Transit right. with the division of the mover and the division of the current, right. the wave and the cow spots. Right. Well, and the, the mover may have the cow spots, but you have the catchy milk house heaters we jingle, do. which I think is yes. just a very catchy jingle. Being a radio guy, you are I'm, radio I'm all guy. into jingles here. Yeah. Uh, give, give us some numbers. Give us a sense if people aren't aware of this, like how many people use the bus service here? Yeah. Some of public transit, there's a stigma uh, yeah, uh -huh. in relation to public transportation, but um, there's not been a lot of education and outreach about transportation along this corridor all the way up through Rockingham into Lebanon service that we run. So I, I think some of our riders that aren't riding, the choice riders that actually could ride from West Brattleboro down into town and, and back home, just are unfamiliar about the options and availability of the bus. 
Um, so I think that's where we're lacking. And part of this whole revamping and getting people at these meetings and doing this broadcast will help them identify and realize, hey, you know, there's there's a lot to this public transit system that I was unaware of. Yeah. Not to mention the schedules are super confusing. I mean, they're all over the place. They're not easy to read. The format needs to be tweaked. So. Um, I think there's just a lot of people that aren't riding because they're unaware of the system and there's a lack of education in what we do. Right. Uh, we're hoping to change that as well. Right. Yeah, you're running uh, several, uh, I think I saw on the website, well, how many buses a day were you running? We, we have um, system-wide, which ranges from just our division, from Brattleboro all the way up to West Lebanon, Dartmouth, right. um, Hanover. Um, we, we have 30 buses in all. We have uh, smaller vans, probably 10 vans that do all of the Medicaid and elderly and disabled medical transportation services. We have 75 volunteers that are running from six in the morning till seven at night. And just the local bus service in town operates 12 hours a day, yeah. basically three routes. So there's, there's over 900 hours of service just in Brattleboro alone. And we operate in 31 towns. Um, and we have uh, a lot of fixed route bus service that just, you know, the buses that you see um, cater around all day long in Brattleboro, Springfield, Bells Falls, all the way up to Okemo and then into, into Lebanon and New Hampshire. We're yeah. also over in Hinsdale. So uh, we've got a lot of territory that we cover, a lot of hours and a lot of miles. Well, and, and that strikes me as another uh, aspect of transportation, public transportation, in a community like this, the ruralness of it. I mean, that's that's probably, a, you mentioned stigma before, but I would think even just the ruralness uh, is something that is probably an even bigger obstacle for people to think, I didn't even know there was a bus that came out here. It's almost the best <laughs> the best kept secret. Right. You know, I didn't, you know, when does this run? How does it operate? Um, and just trying to get people out of their cars. We mm -hmm. love our cars. You know, people love to be able to get in, have their cup of coffee, listen to the milk house heaters on the radio, sing about the, the, the current, but they still, they, they love their cars. But for the state of Vermont is really um, trying to uh, educate people. And to, it's not just public transit and buses, it's car sharing and, and sharing rides. And um, a lot of people don't know that, gee, if I take the bus service, drops me off, what, what happens if, I, if my kid gets sick or if I need to leave right away? Mm -hmm. We have options for that. So, you know, you sign on to um, Go Vermont, and if we took you into work and, the, and you need to leave at a time where the bus isn't there to bring you home, we'll send out a taxi or some other means to get you home if you need to, if you, you have will? an emergency situation, yes. Wow. This is one of the things no one knew about. <laughs> you sign up, you know, yeah. and you're entitled to a certain amount of emergency back home rides a year. Mm -hmm. uh, they're free. And, um, you know, if we get you there, the motto is we, we're, we're, we're going to get you back home. So, you're, so when you say you sign yeah, up, you you're, you're yeah, go to the website, you're you signing to, up for that specific you, service. You go to go to Vermont, you log in, you register, you let them know, you know, what type of transportation service you'll be utilizing, whether it's rideshare, public transit. And if for some reason you need to get home when transportation isn't there to take you home, we'll make sure it happens. Whether we send a volunteer, whether we send a taxi, another smaller van to get you. That's pretty incredible. Yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking about conversations I've had with people about some of their own challenges with childcare, mm -hmm. balancing work, childcare, what happens when the student is home from school and maybe they're a family with just one vehicle. Uh, this is, yeah, this is the kind of thing that you want feedback on and, and probably get more of a sense of who's accessing your services at the August 24th meeting. Right. And, and the one thing about public, people don't want to be stranded. That's one of their biggest fears or... Um, you know, one of the big increases that we have is snowstorms. You know, we mm -hmm. get a lot of people that actually leave their cars at home and get on the bus to get to work. So, um, but we're trying to erase those fears and get people to fall back in love with their public transit and think about utilizing it. Yeah. Um, I've had many conversations with Molly Burke, uh, yes. state representative from here in Brattleboro, actually my representative in, in District 2, but I know she serves on the Transportation Committee. Mm -hmm. uh, and I've had conversations with her about trying to increase awareness, increase access uh, for things like bus service uh, in the different communities here. Talk a little bit about your relationship uh, with the state. Oh, we, uh, we have a strong partnership with the state, VTrans. Uh, we're funded through grants through them. Uh, state and federal funding, uh, they support the bulk of our service. 
Uh, we actually just had our annual review and audit with them, uh, and we work very closely. As a matter of fact, uh, I think Molly has me on speed dial. So I'm sure she does. So if there's any <laughs> constituent that has an issue, she's right. She is right there at the helm to give me a call and say, hey, what's up with this? Um, but we would not exist if we didn't have VTrans and people like Molly and Jeanette White and things like that that are, are right on top of it. She's a, Molly's a really good resource um, and an outlet for learning about, you know, what's going on out there. Um, so our contract uh, with VTrans is an annual agreement. Um, and it's, it's a grant basis, federal and state grants, and that's about 75% of our funding that right. helps operate the system. Um, the rest is through um, public, private shares, public contracts, um, agreements, MOUs, and then fares. Yeah, and probably very little. I mean, I've looked at your, your rate sheet online. I mean, obviously some of the buses are free, uh, yes. but then also your fares, I was gonna think that had to be a very small percentage of your rev revenue stream. Right, yeah, that's like, well, that's one, per supports less than half a percent of wow. our revenue. Wow. But it's about buy-in. Yeah. Yeah, we talked about that. Yeah. And, and when you think, I'm, I'm sure you've had a chance to look at other parts of the state uh, you know, I think about Chittenden County, and they're obviously uh, more metropolitan with Burlington there and, and some of the surrounding towns, or even, even the Northeast Kingdom with Newport or, or Rutland. Uh, how, how would you characterize things that are different about Wyndham County? And I guess, uh, and I guess you reach up to Windsor County as well, don't you, when you're talking? I mean, in terms, of, in terms of some of the things that are different about the service in this parts of the state versus some of the other parts of the state. I would think that, um, you know, like you, you, they're urban. Burlington yeah. is an urban, you know, just like the metro in DC or Boston, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're very urban. They have smaller headways, meaning more buses that come more frequently, like every 15 minutes. So I think the difference down here is that you may have to wait longer for your bus. And that's something we want to look at changing. Nobody wants to wait an hour. Mm -hmm. They want to wait 15 minutes to a half an hour and be able to get from one point to the other point. Um, but one thing that you mentioned is, you know, we may appear smaller, but we have larger, um, larger numbers when it comes to transporting Medicaid clients. In, in this uh, in, part in of this the state. part of the state, yeah, okay. where we, we have a very large amount of uh, transportation need that are done on our volunteer vehicles, 75 vehicles. They, they travel over 2.5 million miles a year. They're just going back and forth from Springfield um, down to Brattleboro and up to, to Dartmouth and Lebanon area. Um, so we've, we're very, very broad reaching and have a lot of ridership, very strong ridership with the volunteer program that you wouldn't know because it's somebody in their car and you wouldn't be able to identify them. We're changing that. We're putting current stickers on the sides of their vehicles. So soon enough, you'll see a lot of uh, probably cars with a current symbol on them right. to be able to identify. Now you just used a term that actually I saw was on the sheet that I wanted to get, give you a chance to uh, define a little bit when you just said headways. And mm -hmm. one of the things that you're looking for some input in is predictable headways. Mm -hmm. well, what do you mean by that? Um, predictable headways where it's, it's, it's um, that could be a bad term, but something that is, uh, we are consistent with our headways, but sometimes what happens on a Friday night when we get in a traffic jam, we're, we're behind, okay. you know, no matter, no matter what we do, Friday night, gallery walk, we're not getting through downtown. So we have to devise a route uh, that circumvents that so you can rely on the bus being there regardless of the traffic configuration downtown. So predictable, consistent, um, and something that works for people, not that hour, hour and a half headway type thing. Right. So that's what we're looking at changing. Okay. And what that's, does that look like? We don't know yet. Right. And, and uh, I think another thing that, that I heard you talking about and, and something that's on uh, the list of things that you're looking for uh, at this August 24th meeting is how you can serve more employers uh, and employees. And, and that, I wonder how many businesses know about that option and, and how that works. Well, we actually, um, GS Precision, we have quite a few people that come from Hinsdale and here in Brattleboro that go to GS mm -hmm. Precision on the first one, uh, SIT, um, and then the um, exit, exit 3 Park and Ride, where the incubator businesses are. We have quite a few people that work there, Price Chopper, Hannaford's, um, and, and, and never have they really been asked, hey, you know, what's your input, what's your need, 
what's your work schedule, what employees are, are, are needing to utilize this service. BMH is one of them, the mm -hmm. retreat. Um, so we, though that's a separate survey and we reached out to them about a couple weeks ago to get their input. Um, and they like the idea that they're part of this process and, and the redesign. We definitely have anchor employers uh, that we have a, a good strong ridership with like um, GS Precision. We're trying to reach out to Omega. We'll probably be in touch with them this week. Um, and a couple of the other, other businesses like I had already mentioned. So we don't want to change that. Um, so yeah, the businesses are pivotal um, and they're, they're part of just creating that anchor that right. starts first thing in the morning. How early do we really need to be out there and how much later do we need to go? I know we have people that work at BMH that need to catch the 53 to get to Brattleboro. Mm -hmm. We're leaving like 10 minutes too early right now. Uh, so that's something we're right. gonna change just right. so we can capture that ridership and, and get them back on the bus. Yeah, I mean, it strikes me that a lot of those employers can be ambassadors for the type of work that you're, or the type of awareness that you're trying to create here. Because I mean, it sounds to me like really what those people at the stops that are in town and taking it from one place to another and knowing they can get where they want to go mm -hmm. in a timely fashion. Mm -hmm. Oh, they sure are, especially the yeah. HR department that can, can broadcast to the employees. And a lot of businesses have incentives for employees to leave their car at home, not take up space in the parking lot, and um, you know, ride the bus. So. Uh, uh, a couple of businesses up in Dartmouth and down here in Brattleboro try to utilize right. the bus service. So there's why. clearly capacity to grow in terms of ridership. Is there capacity to grow in terms of routes? Is that something that's that's part of this process as well? Or do you feel, I mean, again, I look at this map yeah. and you have it pretty well covered for this area. Uh, right, we, for, for the, the, the Brattleboro region, we have probably, um, you know, 9,000 hours that we're going to play with. We're not increasing mm. those hours mm -hmm. because of funding constraints. Right. You know, we only have so much money. So the idea is to utilize and make those hours more efficient. You know, a lot, a lot of what we're hearing is, can you just make the bus run a little bit later? Or we don't really need early morning Saturday service. So it's about shifting the existing hours and, and just making it more attractive. Right. A little more efficient plugging in the holes, getting rid of the redundancies, you know, stops that we don't really utilize or that, that are being utilized and shift those hours. Right. Yeah. Now, a uh, couple things I can anticipate growing up in this community that I think you're gonna hear feedback about, uh, and you and I talked a little bit about one of those right before having this conversation on the air, but it's about, it's about fares. Mm -hmm. uh, and obviously, the more accessible you make it in terms of cost, uh, the more accessible it is. But I mean, there's a feasibility element to that too, as far as making all ridership free. I would, I mean, I, I, it would be a lot easier for everybody if they could just hop on the bus and not worry about a fare card or a dollar or change. Um, the majority of the comments that we've received now and in the past with riders is that a dollar is cheap. Mm. It's definitely cheap. And, and part of the whole funding process is taxpayers contribute to this service. You know, the, the, the town of Brattleboro contributes $50,000 a year to run the service. VTrans supports it in the grant, which is our taxes. And everybody likes to see buy-in. And, and part of that buy-in is the riders contribute as well. Mm. Um, and there's not a lot of grief, I don't, you know, coming from riders that a dollar is too much, it's too expensive. We also have a lot of organization that helps circumvent those rides and may support riders in need and pay for their, their fares. Yeah. Um, it, it would be a lot easier if we were fare free, but we would have to have another contributor to make that happen. Yeah. The buy-in is a really interesting point about it though, as far as people feeling like they have skin in the game and, and wanting to use it saying, all right, I want to get my money's worth out of this if they're buying passes or, or something right. like that. In the actual terms of point of fare, uh, where they get on the bus, it, it must be pretty easy for people to pay with a number of different methods. Yeah, um, change, dollar bills. Right. We also have swipe cards, kind of like right. the smart cards. Right. Um, and we're, we're also looking at some sort like of a, a month rider pass. Oh, okay. You know, right. so it's a certain purchase point and then you can just ride all month, however many rides. Yeah. Uh, we're also looking at um, supporting local businesses like SIT that give us a large, do large donation. Their employees ride for free. 
So if there were other employers that wanted to con contribute and give a donation, their employees could ride for free. Yeah. So there's those types of benefits that we already have in implementing the, the um, monthly fair pass card is something new for us and that will probably come out in the public hearings. Nice, yeah. nice. And uh, the other thing I think you're probably gonna hear about in, in this community is about sustainability, carbon emissions, things like that. I actually remember I was in Baltimore one time and I saw a sign on one of the back of their buses where they were talking about uh, how their buses, and I don't know if it was because they were using some sort of like corn-based fuel or what, mm -hmm. but the, the low emissions or even zero emissions uh, from their public transportation fleet. Mm -hmm. Obviously that takes another whole investment, but uh, I'm sure that's something that you're going to get uh, feedback on then if you haven't already. We were uh, at the mover, we were running on um, converting the oil, uh, vegetable oh, right. oil. The cooking oil, yeah. It's the cooking oil. So we converted that at the mover, but um, there's a shortage. I mean, the amount of fuel that we need to supply these diesel ve vehicles, uh, we, we couldn't find enough of the, 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 the uh, oils. But um, we are looking, we have looked at other op options, gas, you know, uh, electric. Um, the problem with that is our funding comes from VTrans. Right. right now, there's no initiative to change over the fleet into some other type of vehicle um, that, that would assist in what, what you're mentioning. Um, but we have looked at options. So when that funding becomes available, we would be more than happy to take another look at that. Are, are you seeing options. other communities? I mean, obviously I, I mentioned Baltimore, but I'm sure you're seeing this in other parts of the country uh, as well, where, where they're making changes in their fleet in, in this regard. Is that something that you see as a trend or we're also hearing about different vehicles, like even uh, commercial trucks now? trying to get more into the uh, lower carbon emission realm of things. Is this something that, I mean, may, maybe a little bit down the road, but is this something that you think is on the horizon? Um, I, it's really about the, the funding. Mm. Buses that we've yeah. looked at are right. probably three times more expensive than what, and I, I hate, you know, I don't, I don't mean to, to dog it, but no. um, state of Vermont, no. I, I think Burlington, is running some C, um, some some gas, you know, uh, propane vehicles, um, but also the terrain here is very difficult yeah. for, for some of those vehicles. And I know in Maine they're they're working on some some natural gas. They, they you know they have natural gas vehicles, and it was really hot and heavy probably about eight or nine years ago, and the interest is kind of. Of has has slowed down. Right. So we haven't been um, really researching the options mm -hmm. as much as maybe some other parts of the country are right now. Yeah. Of course, yeah. 30, 40 people get out of their cars and get on the bus. That's there doing a go. pretty good job that lowering is, carbon emissions too, it isn't is. it? Yes. <laughs> yeah. It's a little bit. Yeah. We have you know Go Vermont Week, which is curb your car. Right. One week a year. Chance yeah. for people to learn about that on Thursday, August twenty fourth, two public hearings, one at 1.30, one at 5.30 in the select board meeting room. Also, crtransit.org is the website where people can take the survey, whether they're a rider or a non-rider. There's going to be a follow-up public hearing sometime late September, early October. Website place for that. Any other aspects of this uh, that we want? No, I just, you know, I hope we get a really good turnout and uh, we just want to hear everybody's uh, opinions about what they want their bus service to look like. All right, Rebecca Gagnon, great talking to you about it today. Thanks so much. Thanks so much for having us. All right. And thank you for watching Open Studio on Brattleboro Community Television. We want to let you know that you can watch this episode again as well as other editions of Open Studio on the website brattleborotv.org.